This was really about um, how to stand out with a leadership brand. Um, the story on this one was my very, very first workshop that I ever did up in Seattle, Washington, when this company started uh, many years ago, I guess it was back in 1992, is I did this little class called Discover Your Life's Purpose. It was probably a four-hour course, one of those extension classes that you would find at the, you know, the grocery store. And uh, it was something that I was quite passionate about. It was part of my training and it really took off. And it was something that um, I have always been working on and developing over these many years. And um, it, it really is the foundation of what I believe is that you can discover and live your life's purpose at work, not just when you're on your two week vacation in Maui. And I think that is a possibility. I'm not saying it's easy, but I definitely am playing for that kind of uh, goal that, to be able to help people do that. This particular course is really all about authentic leadership, ultimately creating what we would call a leadership brand. It is about self-understanding. It's about understanding your stories and what it is that you have been telling yourself since you were born and what does those stories seem to tell you about where you are now. It's about understanding your values, not from a standpoint of what's present, but sometimes from a standpoint of what's not present. Sometimes when we are in a situation we don't like, it's because the value that we so much adhered to is not present. We can't express it. And so therefore, we go through a little bit of work on that. We talk about, um, if you would please move to the next slide, Melanie, we'll go through the whole model, but I'll give you a quick overview. Of this. The next uh, piece is really about energy and edge. I mean, how do you then decide when is no and when is yes? I would say that if you're going to be an authentic leader, not everything can be a yes. Because if we say yes to everything, then we're allowing certain things into our life that we don't necessarily value or want to adhere to. So it's about really drawing a line in the sand around certain things. I think that at some point, if you are in a company and you've done good work and you're working hard and you're eventually getting noticed, at that point, the organization starts to pile on more and more things for you to do, which is wonderful because you're being noticed for that, but you can also get yourself into a burnout situation pretty quickly. It's that transition from being the individual contributor to being the leader of many that sometimes people have the hardest time because they have to abandon what made them successful in the past, but they at the same time, they have to start learning to be coaches and, and coordinators and so forth and authentic in that. That's the time when you need to learn how to say no. And that's sometimes very difficult for people who are so much about service. Um, and just briefly here too, we also talk about the strengths that you and I have, that if we do those strengths at the wrong time or if we do it too much, they become a derailer. I am a very, very tenacious person. I love getting stuff done. But when my stress starts to hit me, I become a bit of a bird dogger. I can overdo it. And I have, to, and I have some wonderful people in my life that tell me, hey, Dean, you're being the bird dogger. I have to tone it down. And so we are able to um, identify what are the strengths that when stress or sometimes boredom comes into our lives that we are, have a tendency towards overdoing it or using that strength in the wrong way? There's a guy right now I'm coaching who's a CEO of a healthcare system, and one of his particular strengths is that he's bold, and boldness is wonderful. We need that, and he does a very good job of, of being a bold thinker and thinking outside the box. However, when he gets stressed out, he ends up becoming less self-aware, and his boldness becomes more like um, he's pushing too hard and he doesn't realize his own weaknesses and his own um, limitations. And so that's one of the things that happen with that particular strength of boldness. When it's overdone, it becomes, you know, a little bit of a lack of awareness around how you are, um, you know, you're falling down in some areas. We also talk a little bit about integrated life, you know, that's work-life balance stuff. We, we, we briefly touch upon that, but I really believe that's an important piece of this. We can't serve people if we can't serve ourselves. The board of directors piece is really your network. Who do you connect with? There's a great book called The Medici Effect that talks about the cross-pollination of the different industries and how that creates wonderful innovations. Are we networking within our silos or are we networking outside our silos? And then if we... Um, the last piece of this is obviously around your leadership brand. That is the, the statement that really defines the big, hairy, audacious goals that you want to accomplish, but it also clarifies what you believe. If you've ever seen the, the wonderful TED Talk by Simon Sinek, he talks about people don't follow you by what you do or how you do it. They follow you why you do what you do. And if you don't know why you do what you do, then nobody else will be able to follow you. So we really finish up this particular day with a really powerful brand statement. If OSU 
and Nike and other large organizations can have brand statements, if leaders could have that kind of clarity, that kind of potency, others will want to follow them because what you believe in is also what I believe in. And I want to be on that particular ship. I want to be able to follow that. I want to be able to be a part of that. It's in a sense creating like a little movement. So wonderful particular um, program. We love doing it. We've been doing it with the Mayo Clinic for quite a few years and other organizations. And we've just gotten some tremendous results out of this. And it really has pr provided a good foundation for leaders to develop their own, their own course of action. Uh, so I guess the, um, the tip on this one um, is, you know, what do you believe that is, um, you know, a belief statement, you know, things around your work, around your leadership that you think is, is a, a belief statement, not a goal, not an outcome, not a measurement, but what are the things that you really believe to be holding true? And if you can identify that and clarify that in a sentence or two and start to populate that and start to share that with people and see who actually believes the same things you believe, you're going to start seeing some eyebrows go up. I mean, like, for example, as I said before, I really believe that people can discover and live their life's purpose at work, not necessarily just when they're on their two-week trip to Hawaii. I think that's true. I've seen it happen. I believe that, and I want to be about that. And when I, the more I talk about that, the more people go, hmm, interesting idea. I think I want to sign up for that. So that's just one of my beliefs, and I'm sure you have many, but identify maybe a couple of your core beliefs when it comes to your career, when it comes to the way in which you like to work with people or your leadership. We had a great Please. question that really pertains to this section that you were talking about. So one of the listeners today is a, a low-level employee on a large national company and is trying to implement servant leadership. Um, however, management does not act in a way that empowers her or her colleagues. Um, so is there a tip that you could give to how uh, she could communicate with her supervisor, uh, supervisors about walking the walk? Well, that's a great question and certainly one that I've heard before. And it's obviously uh, much more, more complicated than, than we would have time to unpack and, un and understand. But I think that mm -hmm. you have to speak in the language of the person who you're trying to influence. So if you do a person, for example, who's all about numbers and all about data and all about getting business results, then can you make a case for how servant leadership will help them do that? But you can't necessarily come right out and say, hey, I want to be a servant leader and we, we should support that, and we need to be able to have this training program or bring in these coaches to help us learn how to do this, that alone may not make the case. But if you can draw the connection between how does servant leadership, which is really about service to other people, and what does service to other people do? Well, if you think about, if you ever look up the service profit chain, if you Google that, you'll know that when you have employees who provide better service to each other, they ultimately provide better service to their clients, whether they be, you know, external or internal. And those particular outcomes eventually start to hit quality metrics. They start hitting financial metrics. And it becomes a business case when you can draw the line between the different checkpoints, if you will. So my suggestion for this person asking that question is, is start with their major hot buttons, that individual, the leader, whomever. If it's about finances, if it's about results, if it's about productivity, whatever their hot button is, and, and do a little time and strategize, maybe bring some other people in and find a way to be able to link the, the actual experience of being a servant leader to those outcomes. Now, all of a sudden, you're changing their perception. You're helping them see that if we do servant leadership in this particular way, we're going to see some bottom line results if that is, in fact, what they're all about. It does take some time, but I would say speak in the language of the person who you're trying to influence and draw those connections.